Yes, I'm uh, John Bell. I'm J. L. Bell, as I write uh, on the blog Boston 1775 in my history book, The Road to Concord. 1776. You did. And I'm here so sorry. in Massachusetts, we should know that the war starts in 1735. <laughs> and actually, I would argue that it starts in 1774, but that's another thing. Okay. Um, I've <laughs> also. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> uh, and I've also uh, got a couple of comics anthologies here that I've uh, contributed to. I've done. Uh, essays on literary history of various sorts. Uh, I did a long study for the National Park Service, and I've published, I've published fiction, especially for young people. And it's through uh, writing fiction for children that I first started to look at my topic today, which is narrative voice. Uh, point of view is part of it, but when I look at something, I start to analyze it, start to try to break it down into a system. And what I ended up with was six parameters of narrative voice. And I'm now going to pass out a handout. Uh, so take one and pass it back. Uh, can, I have, can you tell me what sort of uh, writing you folks are doing? How many people here write fiction? All right, there we go. How many people here write nonfiction of some sort? OK. In fiction, are you uh, writing for kids, anybody? Young people? Uh, for adults? All right. Are you writing in genres like mystery, science fiction, fantasy? OK. Uh, Albright, um, uh, in nonfiction, are you writing memoir? Or, OK, uh, or sort of a creative nonfiction journalism, writing about other people, writing about history, things like that. Because I, uh, as I, most of my writing these days, in terms of just number of words, is uh, on uh, the Boston 1775 website, and it's about uh, the history of pre-revolutionary New England. Uh, so uh, I still always try to carve out some of my time to write fiction, to write uh, comics, to write other types of articles. But um, I, I sometimes feel like my fiction sides are rusty. Uh, and it's good to go back and look at these um, uh, these uh, fundamentals, like narrative voice. Uh, as I said, I broke down the uh, parameters of narrative voice into what I see as six different areas. Uh, and all of them begin with P. Point of view, perspective, past and present, paper trail, presence, and person. Now, they can be further grouped. The point of view and person grouping up at the, at the upper left are more or less about who. The perspective and past and presence are about when. And the presence and paper trail are about how. So who is telling the story? When is the story being told compared to the uh, events in the story? Or how, is, or how is time being used in the story? And finally, the how, presence and paper trail, what narrative uh, tricks are being used, what form is being used to tell the story. And each of these can be different, and each of these, in being different, it's a choice that you as an author make to tell your story in a particular way, hopefully to advance the story, to make the story uh, work better for you, to t say what you want to say. We have lots of different options and lots of different ways to combine these parameters. So I think, in fact, more important than saying these are the rules and this is how it's done is the idea that actually you have lots of choices and knowing how to make these choices is the way to go. Over. Thank you. Uh, that will make you a more adept, more powerful storyteller as you uh, tell your stories. So let's start with point of view which is what we talked about as, so that's something we often think of when we think, okay, what is the narrative? Point of view is one of the most crucial elements of it. Uh, it's almost synonymous with it. Which character's head, or heads, because there can be more than one, can readers look into? Does the reader know more than the main protagonist, or only as much as the main protagonist? And to illustrate that, on the uh, first flap. So if you open it up to the point of view 
uh, section. I first started with a single point of view from Will. This is The Subtle Life by Philip Pullman. Will tugged at his mother's hand and said, come on, come on. But his mother hung back. She was still afraid. Will looked up and down the narrow street in the evening light, along with the little terrace of houses, each behind its tiny garden and its box hedge, with the sun glaring off the windows on one side and leaving the other in shadow. There wasn't much time. People would be having their meal about now. Soon there would be other children around to stare and comment and notice. It was dangerous to wait, but all he could do was persuade her as usual. Now, what are the signs that this is from Will's point of view? Well, starting first, first word, Will. If you start your story with the name of a character, that character automatically is the default point of view, unless you give readers a real clue shortly afterwards that you're going to be switching into somebody else. Uh, there's, there's no, um, uh, it says at the top of the second paragraph, she was still afraid. It's telling us the mother's emotion, but in fact, it's not saying, it, no, we don't know his mother's name. Yeah, um, we, we don't know his mother. It's, his mother is actually literally introduced as an adjunct of Will. <coughs> so once again, that means that we're focusing on Will. We're seeing the mother through <coughs> Will's eyes. Um, Will looked up and down. That's another sign of single point of view. If you were actually directing your readers to look through a character's eyes, to bring in the world through the character's senses, uh, down at the bottom of that paragraph, all he could do was persuade her as usual. Again, we're in his head, his worldview, his experience. So that is one way, even though it never, it's not uh, a first person I, it, but it is nevertheless very much from, through Will's eyes. And this is what's called the close third person point of view. Another possibility. Uh, after that is, uh, now, okay, um, oh, let me go back. The first, the, a very close point of view, focusing on one character, is most appropriate for stories of internal conflict and change. Uh, it became, point of view, became very important in novels of the late 19th century with Flaubert and Henry James, where they really tried to explore the psychology of a particular character by following that character in great detail. And that was in contrast to the previous uh, style of novels, which were sort of sprawling and big Dickensian epics, where you could jump around from character to character. It was all about the exterior. Uh, so uh, this is one reason why you would choose a narrow, single point of view if you wanted to explore that character and that character's experience in depth. But you don't have to do that. There are plenty of books which jump around among points of view in various ways. One of them is Virginia Euler Woolf's Bat Six, which is my second example on the brochure. It says, Tootie, catcher. Now that it's over, we are telling. We voted to. It's fairer than not. We're not all taking our turns, even the ones who don't want to speak up. I'm going first, because I was first, sort of. Even though it's hard to tell exactly when it began. I mean exactly when. It began so many different places. This is a book which jumps from one narrator to another. That's the whole point of the book. It shows different people, different characters, different people's views of the same events. And uh, it does it very formally by saying, you know, Judy, catch her. It says, right at the start of each section, this is the character who's going to narrate this section. Uh, it's structured almost like a play, and you can see from this little introductory passage that this is um, integral to the theme of the book. Tootie is saying, we're all taking our turns. I'm going first. It began so many different places. It is the Virginia Euler Wolf is signaling us as readers that, okay, we're going to be hearing from lots of different people here. We're going to be hearing different perspectives. And that is a, uh, a very good way to explore that phenomenon of a story that actually is many stories, and that you may not be able to get the whole story, or at least the accurate story, from a single point of view. Um, other books of this sort include What's in a Name by Ellen Whitlinger, where every story or chapter 
has a new uh, narrator, uh, or Hoot by Carl Hyacin, uh, which has a, it has a section break for each new point of view. And some chapters are only one section, uh, some points of view, some characters are the main point of view character for only one section, and then it moves on to somebody else. But Carl Hyacin has no problem switching from one person to another, but always over one person's shoulder. Uh, the Subtle Knife by, uh, Will, by Philip Pullman, which was my first example, that actually starts out with Will, very close to him, but the point of view, the, a, a hallmark of Philip Pullman's writing is that his point of view turns on a dime, and you can go into a scene with one character and zip out of the scene with another character. Uh, and these are things which uh, some people don't like. Some people find disturbing, or they're, you're told not to do it. I think that basically with a lot of these uh, storytelling techniques, if you establish it early and stick with it, then readers will stick with you because they'll know what to expect. If your first chapter is all in one person's point of view, but you really want to explore multiple points of view, you need to signal somehow in that first chapter that it's going to change, like as Virginia euler Woolf did in saying, we're all taking our turns. Uh, Philip Pullman is not, he's, he's more bold about just doing it. Uh, but he has these, you, many of his stories are pretty sprawling stories where there's a whole big cast and you get used to it. Uh, the multiple points of view are most, that st style of storytelling is most appropriate to stories of complex action, to stories where the conflicts between characters' viewpoints are uh, significant to the action, to the, to the uh, narrative. Um, multiple points of view, really it's best if they are distinct. Ideally, readers will be able to pick up in the first paragraph of a new section who it is. And you can do that by you know, putting the main character's name at the start of the section, by giving each narrator a different voice, or a different set of concerns, a different rhythm of language, other things like that, other techniques. There are special cases where, uh, I, hang on, hang on. There are special cases where a, you can have multiple points of view very intertwined because the characters are very close together, like siblings, or twins, or uh, uh, very uh, tight friends, or possibly couples, where if they are acting together and they know each other very well, then maybe you can switch back and forth between you know, this of the three investigators and that of the three investors, or whatever, uh, or the, the Hardy Boys. Uh, Frank saw this, Joe saw that. Um, but usually, uh, it's, it's best to, uh, uh, to decide this is going to be part of my story, the switching of points of view, or the switching of the actions. Um, the next uh, example of a point of view uh, I have here is The Supernatural, from Marcus Zusak's The Book Thief. I could introduce myself properly, but it's not really necessary. You'll know me well enough, and soon enough, depending on a diverse, different range of variable. It suffices to say that at some point in time, I will be standing over you, as genially as possible. Your soul will be in my arms. A color will be perched on my shoulder. I will carry you gently away. This narrative voice is the voice of death in this book. It is a point of view, but it's a very special point of view, a point of view we don't usually see, at least in our own lives, our own daily experiences. It provides a different uh, way of viewing the world, a different way of moving through the world. But it's also, it's still close and limited. It's still the distinct point of view of death itself. Uh, I just wrote a story from a point of view of a ghost who could see everything but couldn't understand everything that she saw because she was from out of town, uh, out of time, and did not know what this society was like. But she could see through walls. She could see uh, all, all these characters in this house. It's, that was an ex exercise in showing and not telling because the reader has to figure out 
through this limited but uh, supernatural point of view what is actually going on with the characters in the story. And finally, my uh, last point of view on this uh, sheet is omniscient. Omniscient, somebody, the narrator knows everything. From blue violets chasing Vermeer, on a warm October night in Chicago, three deliveries were made in the same neighborhood. A plump tangerine moon had just risen over Lake Michigan. The doorbell had been rung at each place and an envelope left propped outside. Each front door was opened onto an empty street. Each of the three people who lived in those homes lived alone, and each had a hard time falling asleep that night. This is a narrator who sees everything. She sees into three separate houses, three separate people who are living alone and private, and is telling us things that no single character could know. Uh, Vermeer, uh, Chasing Vermeer has two protagonists who don't start out as friends. They have to meet. But we can see both of them at the beginning. So we're not, uh, we are following two distinct characters. Now this omniscience in this narrator fits into this story, which is a, it takes place in a world ruled by coincidence, by connections, by puzzles, by the idea that there are all these interlinkings that make sense. So it makes sense to have a narrator looking down omnisciently and seeing all the linkings for us. I actually think there is a, uh, a problem with this book because it's a mystery. And the mystery, or it's set up as a mystery, and yet the mystery depends on all these coincidences and connections. And that's not usually how mysteries work, where there's a sort of cosmic uh, interconnection. Mysteries are usually about, oh, okay, I figured out how this will work in the real world that I know. <laughs> but the narrative voice does work uh, in uh, Chasing Vermeer. Um, as I, I mentioned earlier, that uh, about Philip Pullman, author of The Subtle Knife, uh, here's a uh, article, uh, a quote from an article uh, about him in The New Yorker. Pullman is a partisan of the third-person omniscient narrator, which he thinks is a character in itself, a disembodied sprite. This ringmaster of many a 19th century novel can, he told me, go anywhere and do anything and see anything, and is both male and female, both old and young, wise and foolish, cynical and credulous, all these contradictory things at once. The narrative voice that tells Middlemarch is just as much a made-up character as Dorothea or Mr. Kazabov. So that's an interesting approach to narrative voice, to the omniscient narrator, to see the omniscient narrator as, yes, omniscient, able to go everywhere, able to see everything, but also having a perspective of his or her own. Uh, I don't think that's a rule for every type of omniscient narrator, but it is uh, an interesting way of looking at it. Uh, Brian Jakes, who wrote the Redwall series and other children's novels, he has a narrative voice that tells you everything. He doesn't really seem to believe in show, don't tell. He just tells you. <laughs> and it's, it's one way to use omniscience. Uh, another option, which is not quite so common because it raises questions, is that the narrator can be a, somebody who knows the whole story, is telling you the whole story through his or her character, but doesn't have any role in the plot. Uh, this is how Madame Bovary is, uh, is narrated. This is how a lot of P.G. Woodhouse short stories are narrated, where uh, you go into the bar at the golf club, and the <laughs> oldest member tells you this story about somebody else. Uh, it's, uh, it's another way of getting a very distinct voice into the narration, but it doesn't necessarily connect with the story itself. Uh, yes? Is part of what you're saying, like something like Middlemarch, or George Eliot, or um, uh, Jane Austen, where you know their voice, you know it's, you can tell it's their book because their, their narrative voice is so strong? Um, I don't think that's what Philip Pullman is talking about, because he is very much of a um, uh, I do what I want to do approach to this, which is that, um, yes, we can tell 
uh, a Jane Austen. But he would, uh, Philip Pullman would say, there's actually a different narrator in Sense and Sensibility from Emma from Northanger Abbey. And, uh, but in all cases, um, I think there is a certain sense of, there is that archness about Jane Austen that does all those things. But she's, I think, a little more, uh, because Northanger Abbey is talking about Gothic fiction, it's a little more removed and above things than in uh, some of her other novels. So that's, that's sort of the variation within the sameness. Yes. I think in that case, I mean, we're talking about style. We're also, yeah, that's also More a matter the, of authorial and, and style. voice, but not voice in that sense, because the relationship between the narrator and the material is different, but the style of writing. This is why we, we can locate yeah, we don't, from 19th century. We don't have that many Jane Austen novels, so there's a great variation. Whereas if you look at Dickens or somebody else who's written just a huge amount, then you could probably find more variation in the narrative voice while still seeing a common style. Um, and that's, uh, so it, it's, in all of those cases, it's a little bit, um, uh, because they're writing in the 19th century, or early 19th century novel, they are all usually writing in a third person omniscient form. Uh, and that sort of makes them meld together more. Whereas uh, other authors, like Philip Pullman, will sometimes write in first person, sometimes in third person, sometimes pretty narrow, sometimes pretty wide. Yes? In choosing which point of view in writing a story, how much does the point of your story matter in what you choose? Everything. Yeah. Um, that's, I mean, uh, my rules for point of view start out with choose the best point of view for your story and your style. So if you're writing a story that involves the main character changing internally, then you should choose some sort of narrow point of view. If you're writing a story that involves lots of things happening, you're going to need a wider point of view. If you're choosing a story about how one character responds to lots of things happening, that's really an internal story, even though a lot of things happen, so it should be pretty close point of view. If you're choosing a story about how the same series of events looks different to different people, you have to have a way to do multiple points of view. So those are all, so it really is something I think is sort of fundamental as you think about the story, it's integral to the story. The story should tell you what point of view to uh, adopt. So do you advise, in terms of technique, mm -hmm. laying out your story in an outline, and then looking at it, and then making that decision? Um, I think it's different for everybody, okay. how you get uh, to your end, the, uh, the other side of the checkerboard, as I call it. Yeah. Um, it's, uh, so <laughs> some people will want to write out the whole plot, and then think, OK, how does this work? Others will want, will have a scene. I usually start with a scene yeah. and then think, okay, what happens first? What happens that later? Where's the story? And it gradually comes out. Then there's also, I mean, right now I've got, um, uh, I wrote about this on the blog, I'm writing these stories about a kid with his own spaceship. And yet I'm finding that the way, only way I can tell a particular story yeah. is through somebody else's, another character's point of view coming to meet him. Uh, so even though I'm starting with the idea, okay, here's my main character, I have to pull myself back and say, actually, this other character is the main character of this story, right. the narrator and the point of view character, because that's the only way that story is going to work. And what you just described is um, the narrator is a young, is a relatively young, a teenage yeah. girl. Yes. Is there anything about gender or, or occupying a narrator that you really don't have any experience with? Is that, is that? Um, that's, that's called writing fiction. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah I mean, it's, it's like, uh, in, this, in this story, which is being, uh, one of these stories is being published, uh, um, I think, by the end of the year. Uh -huh. And um, yes, it's a girl. It's also an alien girl. Uh -huh. It's also an alien girl who works at her father's spaceship 
truck stop and fixes computers, and none of these things I've done. <laughs> and so it's a matter of thinking, okay. Alien, right? uh, I mean, the alien part, I'm willing to say, all right, I don't actually know what her hair color is and so on, but that doesn't matter. Yeah. Especially in that story where it's all from her point of view and all she cares about is fixing that computer and getting her father. And, and so I never, there, there's often a case, especially in a, a novel where you try to give the reader clues to what your main character looks like. And so there's often, it's a cliche that in teen novels, there's the uh, chapter one or two, the character looks at the mirror and describes her, oh, I thought I was pretty, or, and it's, I don't do that. I don't do that for this character because that's just not in her personality. Okay, there's a question in the back and then I'll come up front. Yeah, um, do you know, um, are you familiar with the, the stories of Louise Penny? No, I'm afraid not. Okay, well, I'm, I'm trying to differentiate in my thinking and understanding. Um, this author has a lot of omniscient, you know, omniscient narrative voice providing information. It's, it's an ephemeral, never identified, mm -hmm. you know, like you said. Yeah. Someone who doesn't have a narrative plot. But then scattered throughout, she will jump in and out of the heads of various, of several characters, a number of them. And sometimes on the same page. Yep. And, and that then, is. And then, it, and then it's as he, she's using the third person, he, she, mm -hmm. from inside the perspective of these characters. So how? That is a form of omniscient narration, which, as you say, can jump in and out, but it never stays very long in one character. It's always telling you what that character has to say yeah. or think. Uh, so that is a hallmark, a, a something that omniscient narration allows. Omniscient meaning not only I know everything that's happening, but I know what everybody's thinking, and I know how things are connected, and I know how this world, this whole universe works, and I'm going to tell you just as much as you need to know. And do you think that's a harder way to write? No. Okay. In fact, sometimes it can be easier, sometimes it can be a crutch, or if not a crutch, it's, it's just a, a shortcut, I should say, where if the narrator is telling the reader everything, that doesn't leave mm -hmm. the reader as much mm -hmm. to find out. Mm -hmm. That doesn't re leave the characters, in a way, as much to find out. Mm -hmm. uh, so, uh, it, but if that is what Louise Penny, if that's how <laughs> her stories need to be told, mm -hmm. but for her. I think it's about, I think she does that voice less than she does inside the heads of other characters, mm -hmm. the third person. But it is there, so it's helpful to understand how that works. Thank you. Okay. Oh. Yeah. Um, a couple of questions. If you could distinguish for us the differences among the writer's perspective, the narrator's perspective, and point of view as a, as a tool. We're going to get to okay. because all that, these. That, because, yes, they, they all overlap, here. and even the terminology somewhat overlaps. But that's, we're, we're going to talk about uh, the narrator's perspective when we get to what I call presence. Or oh, sorry, the, the writer's perspective at, at presence, also the narrator's. Um, so uh, at this point, it's just a matter of which character or characters we get to follow and get to know the thinking of. Yes. Yeah, I'm thinking of um, Moby Dick, where he yeah. starts out, uh, my name is Ishmael. And as I remember, Ishmael doesn't have much of a, a role in the thing, so it's like that. The third person who's not really involved in the thing, it's like a, sort of a fly on the wall. Yeah, it starts out. It's very, it's very narrow at first on Ishmael as Ishmael goes through the town and gets on the ship, and then it broadens and Ishmael disappears from the narrative practically, and then at the end, Ishmael is the only survivor of the spoiler, spoiler. only survivor. <laughs> of the spoiler. So that is why it has to be Ishmael. But also, Ishmael is interesting as a narrative. Uh, as a narrative point of view, because he's new. And he's a typical New Englander coming from the country to the whaling uh, port. He's not one of the exotics of the harpooners. He's not one of the old salts like the, the mate and Ahab, all of whom he, the narrator explores in great detail. So he is our window into this world. And a window has to be clear. The window has to be not distort things. And that's why Ishmael, for most of the time, is pr pretty absent or transparent. 
does he say I throughout the book? I can't remember. I mean, he starts to call me Ishmael, so been, right away. It's been 55 yeah, years. Yeah, so. <laughs> right away when he says call me Ishmael, and this is, this is my second rule for point of view. Establish your point of view on the first page of your manuscript. When Moby Dick starts, call me Ishmael, it, that is Herman Melville telling us, the readers, this is <coughs> His name is Ishmael. And then it goes on. <laughs> he could just have started, oh, you know, then go down to the sea and ships. And, and he could have started with that om omniscient voice. Instead, he says, I'm starting you narrow with this guy you, you, you've never met. Uh, often, just putting the, the name, as in Will, tugged at his mother's hands, Tootie, catcher. I could introduce myself properly. All of these things are immediately, in the first sentence, telling us readers what's going to, where we should be putting our attention, what uh, people we are going to be looking at this world through. Yeah. There's a whole um, how to start okay. law and order um, where actually the the people and the incident that we see at first um, are not. You know, they die. Something bad happens to them. And then the story changes to our main characters who have to deal with this incident. If you're writing something like that in a book, how do you let people know, or do you just, you know, do the first part and move on to other voices as um, appropriate? That's tough. Well, uh, when you're doing it, you talk about law and order. When you're doing a TV show or a movie or something where the timing is uh, under the control of the storyteller, that's a different dynamic from a book where the timing is under the control of the reader. And yeah, well, I've seen that in mysteries too. It, it sometimes happens yes. in mysteries. A, a, a pretty famous uh, example from the past 20 years is the Harry Potter book that starts with a uh, a scene with Voldemort ending up killing the uh, groundskeeper or something like that, killing a servant. Um, another example, Brian Jakes' Redwall starts with this um, caravan. Uh, moving through town, and it turned out to be the villains and not the heroes. Uh, there are ways of doing it. There, however, if you look at those, you'll usually see that it, that first section is treated using the same rules. It's very clear at the outset who the point of view character is, and often there's a death at the end or something else where you know, okay, that's the end of that story. <laughs> Now I gotta start over again, and so that cues the reader into thinking, okay, chapter two, where's it gonna go now? And then you'll find chapter two usually starts out with a narrow, uh, or a very clear statement of who the main character is. And then, yeah. So for the multiple point of view, um, if you have uh, multiple single points of view, mm -hmm. and, uh, and going into their heads, and you're really following their thought process, do you suggest that um, you put those in different chapters? That's the advice that I've been given because it's hard for the reader to follow and keep going in and out of different people's minds. Or has has it been done well in a in a way that you could? I would say point that out? you could do it within a single chapter. I mean, usually yes, in separate chapters. Sometimes the chapters are even labeled with the narrator point of view at the, at the top. Uh, sometimes, um, it, but I've seen it done other ways. It really matters that A, those voices are distinct, and B, that you establish that pattern, whatever it is, in the first chapter. So if you're gonna be switching around a lot, uh, make sure that your first chapter has a bunch of different switches. And then you could also do things like Virginia Woolf did in Bat 6, where the very things that the narrator is talking about clue us in to the idea that there are going to be switches, that there are multiple points of view. Uh, and that, of course, if you're writing in first person, that has to be in that narrator's character, uh, which, can be different, which can mean different things for different, different uh, personalities. Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, that is a, another way to clue your readers. You're just trying to make the reader comfortable in the first chapter. Because readers are flexible. Once they understand, okay, this is how this game is played, 
they're happy, they're going to be happy to play. They're going to be happy to say, okay, yeah, I'll switch. I'll go, I'll jump over here. I'll see what's on happening on the other side of the war. I'll stick inside this one person's head, as frustrating as it can be, with Emma, uh, or whatever, as long as they know what the rules of the game are. So those are my main three rules for uh, uh, points of view. Choose the best point of view for your story and your style. Establish that point of view on the first page, and then don't slip away from that point of view out of laziness. You can slip away from, from other reasons, as I'll talk later, but not even for a second should you get into somebody else's head if you're going to be sticking with one person's head. You, uh, and that's something which, again, it's, it's a shortcut, it's laziness, you're writing, you, you're drafting, you say, okay, at this point, you know, the mom was feeling sad. If you can find a way to say, oh, Jim saw that his mom was sad, then you're sticking inside Jim's point of view. Mm -hmm. And the important thing, those three rules, choose the best uh, approach, establish that on the first page, and stick with it, those are the same rules for all these parameters. So let's move on to the second panel, the one that says person. Now this is a more dealing with a grammatical term. First person, second person, third person. Uh, these are grammatical terms for I, you, and he or she. And it's based on how the book describes the action. You usually means the reader, but not always. Now point of view and person are very closely linked, but they're not the same thing. So when we talk, and it's easy to confuse them. So when we talk about a first person narrator, that's a narrator who's saying, I saw this, call me Ishmael. However, that character is not necessarily the point of view character. If that character is sitting back and describing what happened to Sherlock or uh, my son or something else, then the uh, the, the character who is experiencing everything is the point of view character, whereas the narrator is nevertheless first person. Um, my first example here is from Freaky Friday, where the first person singular narrator, the I voice, is the protagonist. When I woke up this morning, I found I'd turned into my mother. There I was in my mother's bed with my feet reaching all the way to the bottom and my father sleeping in the other bed. You can tell this was published in 1972. I had on my mother's nightgown and a ring in my left hand. I mean her left hand and lumps and pins all over my head. Hmm. This story, it's all about who am I? So it makes sense to write it from an I point of view. Uh, but the next uh, example here uh, where the first person narrator is really, the first person singular narrator is really the observer. Run, said Soup. Why do I have to run? I asked him. Look behind us, Rob. I looked. We are in Rob's head. We don't see what's behind him until Rob turns and looks. But it's Soup who is driving the action. Rob is simply the observer. And that uh, works very nicely for things like um, mysteries, where <coughs> Watson is watching Holmes, or uh, that Colonel is watching Hercule Poirot. Uh, it's not necessary. It's um, be when you have an I narrator, you are necessarily tied to that narrator's point of view for every uh, defined segment. However, you can use multiple eyes if you have multiple narrators, multiple points of view, multiple narrators. The eye can mean different things in different chapters, if that's how you set it up early. Uh, one interesting way of uh, thinking about this is the uh, Tom Sawyer, Huck Finn slide. Tom Sawyer is in the third person voice. Huck Finn is written in the first person voice, because it is more about what Huck, how Huck changes. And Tom Sawyer is, Tom doesn't change. Tom <laughs> is incorrigible. <laughs> And it's about how he bumps around inside this little society. Huck, however, actually grows. Uh, it often helps the, in, in these soup books, Soup 1776 here, where uh, uh, Soup is saying run and Rob is saying why. 
Soup has the crazy ideas, and Rob is the follower and reactor. And so that's part of that dynamic, and that is why it makes sense to, for Rob to be the I voice, because he's the one being dragged along and observing this and seeing what's happening, and Soup's probably you know, just uh, nothing but fireworks in his head. It would be very difficult to narrate through his point of view and have it anything coherent. It creates a comic effect because of that contrast. Um, stories that depend on an incomplete knowledge of the protagonist, it makes sense to narrate from an observer first person point of view. Uh, there are actually uh, a couple of short Sherlock Holmes short stories narrated by Holmes or narrated in third person without Watson, but we don't remember them. <laughs> <laughs> we only remember the ones where it is Watson watching this person trying to keep up, just as we readers are trying to keep up with him. The other very common uh, person in narrative voice is the third person, usually uh, where uh, the narrator is looking at the protagonist and all the other characters and using he, she, or they. As in Stuart Little by A.B. White, when Mrs. Frederick C. Little's little son or second son arrived, everybody noticed that he was not much bigger than a mouse. The truth of the matter was the baby looked very much like a mouse in every way. He was only about two inches high, and he had a mouse's sharp nose, a mouse's tail, a mouse's whiskers, and the pleasant, shy manners of a mouse. It's very important in this story that we see Stuart from the outside. If we saw that same scene from his eye point of view, from his first person point of view, well, A, he's a newborn, so it wouldn't be very coherent, <laughs> and B, he doesn't, he thinks he looks like himself. It would be a different story uh, for him uh, through his eyes as opposed to looking at him and saying, okay, this person is physically different and I can see that because I'm outside him. Um, it can still be used. The third person doesn't mean that you're using, uh, that you're not using single point of view. There is something called the close third person, where you are really over the shoulder or even inside the head of your he or she character. And that is very common, and uh, in some ways, uh, sort of the default setting for storytelling in many genres. Uh, but nevertheless, there are advantages to using the he or she uh, instead of the I in that case. There are less, um, less common uses of person. Uh, I've got a, uh, one is the second person, the you. Very rare. Uh, but it's if you give a mouse a cookie, that's a picture book, short picture book that is written in the second person. Uh, my first book, Soap Science, it was a nonfiction book about experiments, and it was all in the f second person. You do this, you do that. You get these ingredients, and you put them together this way. Uh, interactive fiction, like Choose Your Own Adventure, is in the uh, second person. And then every so often, there is a novel written in the second person, written with the character being referred to as you, uh, the, the, uh, the narrative voice referring to you. Uh, and I have an example here, uh, Todd Strasser's confidence. Stop it, Lauren. Your best friend, Tara Sneed, places her plump elbows on the table and leans forward. A warm flush crosses your face. What? It's, it, it doesn't feel right to me, I gotta say. <laughs> <laughs> if, if I wanted to, to write, read a book in which I was called Lauren, my mother would have called me Lauren. Uh, <laughs> and it's, it's just, it, it is unusual, but it can be done, or at least it can be published. Um, it does, I think the narrator is trying, or the, the author is trying to draw us in through the use of that second person, and I'm not sure it really works. But that's a, there is a choice out there. Yeah. Part of the complicating factor is being able to distinguish between the rhetorical view, which could be in the voice of the narrator, and you. And there is some literature, shorter pieces like. Jamaica Kincaid and Atwood short pieces mm -hmm. where you can pull that off. But most of the longer ones, the you, and I'm not familiar with what you mentioned, is using a you as a rhetorical you, not as a Yeah, I mean, it, it is, the you is the reader. And in this case, 
this is the rare example where the you is involved in the story, not just hearing the story, but somehow involved in the story. And as it, yeah, it's quite rare. Yes, sir. I, I'm curious, what, in your writing, how much do you, like, I mean, I think we probably all gravitate to a certain point of view in the way we set up our stories. I might be wrong about that, but, but I'm curious about how much you fiddle around with the point of view. Geez, I wonder how it would sound this way when you have a story in mind. Um, I will usually, before I'm drafting a story, sit down to draft it, I usually have figured it out, and I don't usually change. But there are times when I have a plot in mind. And as I said, I usually start with a scene, and then I figure out what's going on. So I usually start with a plot. Um, where I have a plot, and I'm trying to think, OK, how, how does this work? I mean, what, where is the door into this story? Where is the best route to it? And at that point, I will consider different possibilities. And I'm pretty comfortable, especially after I did this analysis, thinking through, OK, should it be first person, should it be third person, should it be present tense, should it be past tense, and, and thinking about all the options. So I don't, I try not to fall into the same default setting. I know that there are cases, there are people in my writing groups and others who have thought, you know, this isn't really working, let me try rewriting it in first person instead of third, or in third person instead of first, or in somebody else's uh, perspective. And so that is another way to get across to the, the other side of the checkerboard. It is something which people have found to be helpful. Uh, I have not, fortunately, had that, uh, gone that far down the road and had to do it over again. I've rewritten in other ways. And, and you can mix and match, right? I was recently told that if you start in third person, you should go third person all the way through, which we're not doing, by the way. But. Um, if you're going to change like that, then I think you need to signal your reader in the, uh, in the early chapters that that's going to be a possibility. Um, and uh, you, have to, you need a reason to do that besides just trying to make it easy for yourself storytelling. On the other hand, there can be good reasons to do that. Yeah. My first novel, I wanted close characters. And I used close third, but I had an omniscient narrator Mm -hmm. who wasn't really telling all the action, but was there to fill in in between. And it worked well, I think. The second one, I realized that the girl, who was a white girl in the 70s in western South Dakota, could not possibly understand mm -hmm. the other person she was paired with, a, a Native American woman. So I just don't write in close third to that narrative of Native American woman. Just, just the main protagonist. As they get to know each other, it'll be reflected in that first person's mind, and that's really pretty much like what the experience is. You cannot know mm -hmm. that culture. So now, when you're, uh, are you using first person, the I voice, or no. are you still using third person, but close third, third. Per close third person with one character, but not with the other? Right. Yeah, and that's and that approach, um, as you say, it's partly based on the changes that are taking place within the point of view character's head, which in this case is the young woman, well, young white woman, as opposed to the Native American woman. Yeah. Okay, here and then back. Yes. Uh, do you know the second person voice in Wuthering Heights? Um, that's the that's No, the I, I, I actually, I realized a couple months ago that I'm, Bronte deficient. So okay. I'm, presently, I'm presently reading Jane Eyre, and nobody told me about those wonderful first chapters in the school. Uh, but anyway, okay. uh, so no, I don't know whether or not. Okay, I was going to ask you how you thought that worked, but okay. All right, <laughs> and in the back. Um, I'm not really understanding close third person. Can you explain that a little further? Okay, um, close third person. He walked down the street. He had walked down the street several times before. It always made him nervous. Probably because he was, I mean, you're saying he, 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 but you're telling us mm -hmm. inside that person's head, mm -hmm. inside the brain, so you know, the reader ends up knowing intimately about what, how that character is thinking, and the, it's almost as if there's a camera over that person's shoulder following him around so you don't cut away mm -hmm. to some other scene. 
but also that camera is a mind reading camera, or it can be, and so you are seeing what that reader, what, what that character thinks. Mm -hmm. By close, you just mean only one character. Close. Is that what you mean by close, as opposed to? The, the, it's a combination. Oh. Close is usually a combination of being in one character's head and being over one character's shoulder. And you can use close third-person narration with different characters oh, okay. so at different it's times. Where the, the camera's here and inside the head. Yeah. Okay. Uh, or, uh, or you can use you can there you can say only over the shoulder and not say what's inside the head and let that be a mystery and let readers figure that out based on what the character is saying and doing outwardly. You don't have to be inside the head, but those two things together is a way of saying this. Yes, I'm. I, the narrator, am outside because I'm referring to this character, the he or she, and yet I am privy to everything. So you're not going to describe a landscape without a person in it seeing it. That's right. And you're also probably going to be describing that landscape not only from that person's eyes, so what she only can see, but also possibly through her emotions. So if she is feeling or me or memories. groovy, then she's going to talk about this gray sky and not about the, the death. But this, but this can be through the omniscient narrator as well? It is, a, it is a form of omniscient narration. And the question is, as an omniscient narrator, if the narrator knows what's going on inside this one person's head, is it close enough? Is the, can, the, can that omniscient narrator refrain from telling us what's in other people's heads <laughs> or telling us what that, other character, what that character cannot know? Mm -hmm. That's what defines close. Where, you're, where the perspective, uh, what, what the reader is seeing and picking up is a pretty narrow focus. Just on, <coughs> just on one, other one other character? You, you, usually it's just one character mm -hmm. is a close third person, but it can switch from one character to another in the same, uh, in the same book if you've established that pattern. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and when you are either in first person with the point of view character or close third person in the point of view character, that usually means that what's happening inside that character, point of view character's head is where the story is taking place. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's where the changing in thinking, changes in emotion uh, fit that type of narration. But if there's an omniscient narrator who that is occasionally dropping information, you know, into the story, um, and there are numerous characters' thoughts and feelings being dropped into as he, she, mm -hmm. that's not the same as close third. That's just an omniscient narrator. If, if, close yeah, I mean, if with, you're with if you're never limiting yourself as the author with your narrative voice. If, you're, if the narr narrator can say anything can, uh, to readers at any time, mm -hmm. then that's not close. Right. It doesn't give that sense of close. And this narrator I'm talking about, because I'm still thinking about Louise Penny and what she's doing, that narrator is not a character in the story, does not have a role in the story. Not necessarily. That narrator that right. does not. That, that narrator can be a disembodied uh, voice yeah hovering above the action. And so it then could that's, be an observer. That, and then that's not close third, because close third is through the perspective of someone who's in the story. No, no, no. close third is uh, following somebody in the story. So it could be an omniscient narrator saying, you know, uh, and at this point, you know, Jamie felt that she was being brave, but in fact, she was simply mm -hmm. uh, acting out the same scenario she had since she was in her 20s. <laughs> That's something which Jamie does not know. So it's not her close, it's not close because it's not telling us her view of things. Oh, it's okay. omniscient. Yeah. Oh, okay. As I remember, Louise Pitney often uses that voice to talk about setting. Uh, the stories are, a lot of them are set in a, a particular village and mm -hmm. it's kind of a magical, mystical place. So. And that, yes, that would make sense uh, yeah. where you have that hovering voice. Uh, and that harboring perspective, mm -hmm. the viewpoint, which can see the whole village, which mm -hmm. can see the connections. Mm -hmm. um, I would, I, if you're thinking of that as a model, of Louise Penny, Donald, as a model, I would look very closely at how she starts mm -hmm. and what they, uh, what those 
opening chapters, how they do it. What is the first voice? How many characters she follows mm -hmm. closely and yeah. puts up in the head of in that first chapter? Mm -hmm. In the back? Just mention the opening of Ragtime. Are you familiar with that? Yes. Which is the authority of a journalist, but a journalist of the times. From the, I, I first thought both times reading it, it was this like a Hitchcock pan in, but he goes back and forth. He's, he's looking at all of New York City, 1905. And then into it into the house. Then out in it. So he's an yeah. authority as a journalist from any camera angle and any intimacy he wants. And he sets that up in the first thrilling five pages. Yep, yeah. and that's the goal. Breaking all the rules. Chapters, multiple protagonists, multiple storylines, and even the title, Ragtime, that talks about a whole time, a whole era yeah. of uh, New York, really. But, uh, and that but it does take you the camera. It's almost like a cinematic, it takes the camera. So, so it never jars, it's just mm -hmm. shocking. Because he, uh, the, you guys know, now, Eo Lacro was, uh, was an editor, book editor, before he began writing his own novels. So he got a lot of experience seeing how different, different uh, approaches work. So this is like a grid. Down one side of the point of view, across the top is person, and there's these boxes, and it could be, so single could be first, either protagonist or observer, or third person. And what you're advocating is just choose and set it up in your writing. That's right. Understand that you, when you are writing a first person <coughs> voice, for instance, that doesn't that first person voice doesn't have to be the protagonist. Doesn't even have to be in the story. Right. On the other hand, you could write the same story from a third person point of view, but close to the protagonist. So, so there, yes, yes, there are all these different parameters. But in sure. fact. And we're going to move on. Yeah. There are even more parameters. So <laughs> not just two dimensions, but six dimensions. <laughs> if your head isn't spinning yet. Yeah. Uh, let me just finish with the, the first person plural to finish with person, uh, which is one of my uh, favorite narrative voices. Uh, e. Nesbitt, the would be good. Your loss is indeed a terrible one when your father is ashamed of you. And we all knew this. So that we did have felt in our chests as if we had swallowed a hard-boiled egg whole. At least this is what Oswald felt. And father said that Oswald, as the eldest, was a representative of the family. So of course the others felt the same. This is a wonderful uh, narrative voice, which is first-person plural. It tells the stories: we did this, we did that, we did that. And yet, inside it, you can see that in fact. The person writing this all down is Oswald, because it's always Oswald who's got bright ideas. Or if he doesn't have bright ideas, he would have had the bright idea just a second later, so he really should get part of the credit. And things like that. And it's just terrific. And it's, a, you, it's again, the, the, the point of view, the, sorry, the person, the storytelling, the narrative voice is part of the story itself. So I do recommend E. Nesbitt's uh, uh, work uh, all over the place. Um, Another book that uses uh, uh, the second person is called You Don't Know Me by David Class. And that uses, that jumps to the second person to dissociate the narrator from what's going on because it's so traumatic. So there are different, it's rare to use the second person, but it is, uh, it does work for certain narrative uh, choices, certain narrative challenges. <coughs> Now, I'll move on to the next panel, which is called Perspective. This is my term. You're not going to find this in any writing manuals. But perspective is, by that I mean, how close is the narrator in time to the events that the narration, the person is narrating, that narrative narrative. There's immediate, where too many, Jamie shouted, and slammed the door behind him. What, said Will? Too many kids in this family. That's just too many. We're in that moment. We have no idea, or the narrator is not telling us any idea of what happened before, what happened later. There's no distance. It's just there in the moment. That's the most common. But you can also do a very recent one, as in Maureen Daly is the 17th summer. I don't know why I'm telling you all this. Maybe you'll think I'm being silly, but I'm not really, because this is important. You see, it was different. It wasn't just because it was Jack and I. It was something more than that. So this narrator has a certain amount of distance, a certain amount of perspective on the events, and is trying to explain the events from a, uh, a later time, but a recent events, so that not a whole lot of time has passed. Um, mention 
this, uh, the, when you have uh, an immediate point of view, you can often immediately start momentum as, okay, what's happening, what's happening? You're, you start at an energetic point of view, an energetic moment, and just the story keeps rolling. Um, but with uh, a more recent uh, perspective, that can sometimes hook the readers because you can have an outcome. It can be overused, as in the had I but known stories. <laughs> had I but known that this would happen, I would not. Well, that's a recent point of view. Uh, but the approach, by saying, as uh, 17 Summer says, really, this is important. It's telling you something important is going to happen. I'm going to tell you something important. Wait for it. Stick with me. Um, it gives away, a recent point of view gives away some of the ending. Because you know that the narrator has survived. So it's not really the best voice for a thriller. You don't really want to st start out a thriller and say, well, <laughs> good thing I got away from that shark. You have to start with, the shark was after me. You have to start with the immediate. Um, you can make the narrative catch up with the point of view, where sort of your narrator is taking the perspective of, say, I'm going to tell you about what happened three days ago, and then two days ago, and then one day ago, and now I'm dealing with the now, and then uh, continue on in the, in the immediate point of view. But uh, there are, um, nevertheless, there, are, there is a distinction between recent and immediate. And finally, there are also what I call a retrospective point of view, an example here from the Great Brain Reforms. My brother Tom and the elder brother Swain arrived home for summer vacation on Sunday, June 5th, 1898. I remember the date very well because just two weeks later the entire town of Park City was destroyed in the worst fire in the history of Utah. This is a book being published in 1973 telling us about events in 1898. And clearly this person looking way back and this is also uh, a narrative uh, voice which shows up a lot. Again, it tells us that the narrator has survived. It tells us that the world is still going. But it also hints that there's going to be, if not wisdom, at least perspective, at least distance from these events. Uh, it can be, the, the retrospective can be the voice of the adult that the young character has become. Uh, perspective actually defines, I think, the difference between young adult YA stories and Bildungsroman, German term for stories of uh, coming of age, except those are usually written from the point of view, from a perspective of looking back and thinking, this is how I came of age, whereas the YA is saying, like, 17th summer, this is important right now. This is, uh, this is a, um, a much more teenage voice. Teenage, why I think that teenage concerns are incredibly important. Buildings Roman thinks that they are things, teenage concerns are things to get over and get on with your life from. Uh, so that's uh, another choice that you can make, another set of parameters. Um, let's see. We've gone through three <laughs> of the parameters now. Everybody uh, still with me on it? The next P is past and present. This is something you're probably very familiar with. It's grammatical. Past, present, and future are all tenses for verbs. The past tense was once standard in all novels, and therefore it has a comfortable, traditional, unobtrusive feel. Uh, here's an example from Dio and Jones, The Lives of Christopher Chant. It was years before Christopher told us anything about his, anyone about his dreams. This was because he mostly lived in nurseries at the top of the big London house, and the nursery maids who looked after him changed every few months. Well, one way that that past tense serves Diana Wynne Jones' purpose is that she's just gotten us through years of life in two sentences. Uh, that's, um, that's something that past can do. Whereas in present tense, you are in the moment uh, Older students are allowed to roam the hall until the bell, but ninth graders are herded into the auditorium, starts out Laurie Hall's Anderson's speak. Present tense has become much more popular in the last generation since uh, Bright Light's Big City, and nevertheless, it's still as popular as it is, it still retains this edge. And if you're writing edgy stories, present tense is often the way to go. 
It's supposed to connect to readers' own lives. Um, there are examples of people using the first person present tense voice for historical fiction, i.e. a person, a, a character in the past telling you a story in the present. I got on the locomotive and we went chasing after the buffalo. Well, that's past. I get on the mo locomotive. We go chasing after the buffalo. That's present and it seems to feel more immediate, more uh, bring us in. Mostly I think this past and present uh, choice is a matter of taste. Um, I tend, um, I usually don't use present voice, but there are certain narrators which I look at and I say, you know, this guy is really in the moment. He's going to, he would say, he would tell his story in the present tense. Uh, so that's another choice. Uh, I have found only one book that is written in the future tense, <laughs> Moon Tiger by Phyllis Root. But again, that's a choice out there. Uh, I don't think there are enough books to know how it really works, what it, what it, how, how readers uh, use it or, or expect it to work. But there is a choice. Yes. Yeah, so, a Moon Tiger by Phyllis Root. <laughs> If we move on to the next panel, what I call paper trail. This is where I start to strain the peas a little to make everything be a pea. But uh, a paper trail, originally novels were a, type, a new type of literature in the uh, early modern period, and they were pretending to be something else because people didn't know what to expect. So they pretended to be biography, like Don Quixote, or autobiography, like Robinson Crusoe, or letters by, like Pamela. And then authors, after a while, realized that their readers didn't need that camouflage. They were perfectly willing to sit down with this long book and listen to this voice just tell them a story. And they stopped, novelists stopped needing to use the artifice of the documents, stopped needing to pretend that these were biographies or, or letters. <laughs> And so now it can seem artificial to be reading somebody's diary or re reading, and yet that can be powerful. If, again, if you establish that as this is how the rules of this game are going to work, then that'll work. And so I have some examples here. An epistolary novel is one that is in the form of letters, and that is usually from the, uh, it's a good way to show multiple perspectives, two people going back and forth. A diary gets you into somebody's, one character's head. Mm -hmm. The strength of that are you get the character's words and the feelings and the realism of that, and the reader gets to assemble the picture from these documents. The perspective of a diarist does not know what's coming the next day, although she knows exactly what happened that day. There are some weaknesses, however, because perspective in both epistolary novels and diary novels is limited. The perspective, when I talk about how distant you are from the events, well, if you're writing your letter at the end of the day on Saturday, you know everything that's happened on Saturday. You're not going to tell it in an immediate idea, in an immediate uh, way. You're not going to say, and then this man came in, and I didn't know who he was, and it was my grandfather. <laughs> you're going to say, my grandfather arrived today. Uh, and it's, it's not as dramatic. It may not work for that story. Uh, the details are also limited by what details that character, your narrative character, would put into those documents. In a diary, people can, might open up more than in a letter to a particular other person. And when you're writing a novel from, in a diary or letter or other documentary form, you really can't cheat. You can't, uh, it, it really takes the reader out of the fiction if you are slipping in information which would not be naturally in those documents from those characters. Uh, it's also interesting to think of how in those stories, the documents themselves may play a role in the story. What if somebody else sees the letters? What if the letters are lost? What if somebody, the diary, it falls into the wrong hands? The document is a physical prop and the act of writing can change the situation. So those are reasons to use those forms of novel, those paper trails. 
other paper trails that novelists have used recently, uh, a documentary, uh, what should I call documentary here, a homework assignment. Oh. Sharon Creech's <laughs> Love That Dog takes the form of a kid who is having to write poetry, he doesn't like to write poetry, and he writes poetry about having to write poetry, which he doesn't like, and he gradually he learns to express himself in poetry. Um, that's different from writing a novel in verse, or at least it's a subset of a novel in verse, because a novel in verse has a authorial narrator. Uh, another recent example, Walter Dean Myers wrote the novel Monster in the form of a screenplay because his character is really involved in movies. Uh, TTYL, TTFN, and other uh, stories by Lauren Myrtle, those are told in instant messages. This is a very, uh, an increasingly uh, popular form, as I understand it, in Japan, where uh, <laughs> so much communication is done in instant messaging, uh, you can just use that for dialogue throughout. Uh, so this is a, uh, another narrative choice you can make. And finally, my sixth P is presence. How much does the voice that you've chosen remind us readers that we're hearing or reading a story? Does the voice comment on the action? Does the voice comment on storytelling itself? Or on the, the uh, action of reading itself? So if the narrator is simply laying back, as in The Wonderful Wizard of Oz, Dorothy lived in the midst of great Kansas prairies with Uncle Henry, who was a farmer, and Aunt Em, who was the farmer's wife. The house was small, for the lumber to build it had to be carried by wagon many miles. There were four walls, a, roof and a floor and a roof, which made one room, and this room contained a rusty-looking cook stove, a cupboard for the dishes, a table, three or four chairs, and the bed. We don't know what opinion that narrator is expressing about anything. It is just the facts laid out. On the other hand, Christopher Paul Curtis's Bud Not Buddy is reflective when the narrator says, I'm not bragging when I say that I'm one of the best liars in the world. <laughs> but I got to tell you, Todd was pretty doggone good. It seemed like he knew some of the same things I know, the things I think of all the time and try to remember so I don't make the same mistake more than seven or eight times. This is a reflective character, a reflective voice, where the storyteller is uh, much is expressing opinions, expressing how things have, uh, highlighting how things have changed. You can even get more intrusive, as in the Lemony Snicket books, which brought back the intrusive narrator into children's fiction uh, 20 years ago. If you are interested in stories with happy endings, you would be better off reading some other book. In this book, not only is there no happy ending, there is no happy beginning, and few happy things in the middle. <laughs> and that's, uh, that is telling you, I am telling you a story. You are reading a story. We're going to have fun writing the story, except it's not going to doing the story together, except it's not going to be fun at all, but that's part of the fun, because I'm I mean, it's, it's really <laughs> getting in your face, that authorial narrative voice. And I think it's possibly even uh, gotten uh, overdone now, but, by golly, it, it works for that. Um, and that, in fact, we can go back to E. Nesbitt in the early 1900s and late 1800s to find an intrusive narrative voice. We can go back to earlier novelists. It's gone in and out of fashion. So, Lemony Snicket reinvented something which was already out there, and that, in fact, sort of fit the milieu of those books, which is sort of old-fashioned melodrama. Uh, and the narrative voice is part of that. Uh, and finally, I have an example here of what I call metatextual narrative voice, <laughs> where uh, there, the story it is not talking explicitly about the fact that you're reading a story, but M.T. Anderson in Wales on Stilt says, Katie Mulligan lived in Horror Hollow, a little suburban development just off Route 666. Living in Horror Hollow, Katie had lots of experience with zombies, werewolves, and flesh-eating viruses. She even had her own series of books about her adventures, the Horror Hollow series, and the fan club. So it's not saying, I'm intruding on you, it's just reminding you, in a not very subtle way, but in a subtle way, that these are, there are books out there, there's a storytelling, there are ways, uh, there is a whole culture of novelists and readers 
and I'm going to make you think about that while you're participating in the culture while reading this very novel. Other examples of that are like The Curious Incident of the Dog in the Nighttime by Mark Hatton, where the narrator is explicitly trying to model his investigation on the Sherlock Holmes stories. So the narrator and point of view character is trying to model himself on fiction. And it's not working out for him. <laughs> uh, the effect sets a mood, uh, establishes character. The story doesn't work out for him the way he wants. Um, Benicula, another children's novel, starts out, the first scene is a dog delivering a manuscript to a publisher. <laughs> The effect, again, sets this mood, uh, and uh, it reminds us that the story that follows is something which has been constructed in a particular character's voice for our entertainment. So those are like six parameters, and as we said, you can combine different ways of doing things. So if you choose a diary, then that will give you a point of view character, that will give you an I character, the person, that will give you a perspective on the events uh, changing each day. That will probably give you a sense of presence because the narrator will be talking in her diary about the act of keeping the diary and reflecting on the, the day's events. You can choose an omniscient. You can choose a uh, first person. So all these things can be mixed and matched. They're probably in that uh, great you know, six-dimensional uh, tic-tac-toe grid, there are probably s spaces that don't quite work. It, you can't really do an omniscient diary. You can't do uh, <laughs> things like that. But there are many more possibilities than just he, you know, Dick and Jane went to the store. Um, so in general, I would say there are three approaches. This is what I'm going to leave you with here. Approach number one, give readers a familiar, straightforward pattern, set it up early, give readers clues to the significant parameters, like who is the main character, what is the voice, uh, uh, how, many main, how many points of view characters are there, stick to that pattern, make the most of it. It produces a story that readers can enjoy. But if you want to play a little more, you can choose unusual parameters that fit your story. Uh, you can say, okay, I'm going to do present tense, because this is a really action-filled story. Again, stick to that, stick your choices, make the most of them. Uh, be certain, know how that choice affects the other parameters. <coughs> and then the third approach, break the rules. Mm. Upend readers' expectations, <laughs> set up a pattern, and then subvert it for the sake of the story. You can combine narrative formats, like Crisscross by Lynn Ray Perkins includes prose, poems, and Q&A. Hmm. Uh, break out of one point of view at a crucial point, if you want. Tom Sawyer in Mark Twain. Now, Tom Sawyer is a very traditional third-person narrative following behind Tom Sawyer's shoulder, close third person, for a long time. And then when he's stuck in the cave, the narrator shifts to follow Huck Finn. Yeah. And suddenly, this kid who is, you know, the outsider who nobody cares about, he has to save Tom. And we are behind his head as he goes into town to try to find help. From the mixed-up files of Mrs. Basil E. Frankweiler by E. L. Conningsberg, classic novel from the early 1960s, most of the book seems to be in the third-person point of view following Claudia, right over her shoulder, what she thinks, what she's planning, where she's going into the museum, and then, suddenly, about two-thirds or three-quarters of the way through, you realize that the narrator has been Mrs. Basil E. Frank Weiler all along. <laughs> with the perspective of knowing this whole story and having spoken with Claudia, that's how she knows what's in Claudia's head. Now, that's, in fact, revealed in a foreword in that book. And that foreword, is it really necessary? Is it there to establish that shift so that we kind of forget about it, but then when it comes, we think, oh, OK, she wasn't cheating. <laughs> she gave us a clue I just forgot, like a mystery. Um, you can also create an unreliable narrator, as in Robert Cormier's I Am the Cheese, or Agatha Christie's The Murder of Roger Ackroyd. 
Uh, know the whole arsenal of choices that are available to you. Make choices not out of laziness, not for shortcuts, but for the sake of your story, and that will work. That will make your story more powerful. So those are my six parameters of narrative voice. Thank you very much for sticking through them. And I'm happy to uh, talk more about your individual storytelling challenges and questions. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you.